audio check. Teams audio check.
Do you want to kill your video and then we can see everything full screen on mine? Bruce and John, you turn off your video, then it goes full screen to everyone. Good afternoon. I do appreciate what you're talking about. It's probably more exciting than the, the, the business ahead, so apologies for interrupting. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Lovely to see so many here. I've got to do my um, easy jet introduction, so I should read it verbatim. I would like to welcome everyone to this face-to-face -face meeting of the executive of the new council chamber in line with public health recommendations to exercise caution and our own health and safety advice. The number of councillors, officers and members of public in attendance in the chamber is still limited to ensure the meeting can take place safely. There is an option to join the meeting via Microsoft Teams for those councillors and officers who do not feel yet comfortable attending in person or are unable to do so. They will be able to partake in but will not be able in attendance formally and if a member of the executive will be unable to vote or count towards the quorum of the meeting. We are streaming today's meeting live on the internet and a recorded version will be available to view within 48 hours <coughs> on the North Somerset Council website. Thank you. So we now move on to the formal agenda. The first item is addresses by members of the public. Um, we have, I believe, two. The first is from Trevor Garfield. And I don't think Trevor can be here today, so I think that um, our sister Nick Brain is going to read out his statement. That's correct, Chairman. Thank you. This is a statement on the local plan from Trevor Garfield. I was horrified to see that Elm Grove Nurseries is included for development, as shown on page 14 of the public document pack. This land has been the subject of two development plans in recent years. There were two rejections by your own planning department and a planning inspector and a high court appeal, which also rejected the plans. Land around Rocking Village is now heavily developed and Locking Village would be compromised. The main access from the new co-op shop has no footpath to the land in question and no prospect of one as there is no space, etc. Many other reasons given in the inspector's report. This land needs to be withdrawn from your plans without delay. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Garfield. That, that will be noted and referred to for consideration under item number nine on the local plan. The second one is from Creston Bowes from Sanford, and I believe that uh, Creston Bowes is here in person. Lovely. Thank you. Uh, the Banwell Bypass project is extremely controversial. It means building a new road over part of the Mendip Hills AONB, countryside, agricultural land and floodplain, cutting into a protected groundwater source and protected rare bat habitat, and building a car-dependent new estate on Greenfield. The project will substantially increase carbon emissions from its construction, operation, and the tailpipe emissions year on year from additional cars from the 2,800 unit Wolvers Hill Estate enabled by the bypass. This jeopardizes the council's aims to achieve net zero emissions by 2030. It is of great concern that the council is proceeding with this plan without a, a review of the project's carbon cost, which is required by the council's own transport plan and climate emergency policy. The joint local transport plan, JLTP4, requires a review of all identified schemes, including the bypass. It states any schemes would be subject to further detailed feasibility work and consultation, as well as requiring planning permission, as does Appendix A of the Weka Action Plan, which says all proposed major transport schemes should be reviewed against the emerging evidence base for meeting our jointly stated ambition of carbon neutral emissions by 2030. This is marked as a short-term action. The North Somerset Climate Emergency Strategic Action Plan states that all major council projects should be assessed for their impacts on carbon emissions. These reviews have not been carried out. The bypass project, if it goes ahead, will have a damaging effect on the council's aim to reduce car dependency and promote more sustainable modes of travel for the foreseeable future. 
both the council's new local uh, plan, tribal transport assessment, and the transport for new homes report predict that Wolvers Hill, the new unit, 2,000 unit, 800 units, will be a car dependent commuter estate. As we know, government funding for better bus services is lacking. The council does not have the funds and the developers won't pay. Another deeply damaging effect will be the cancelling out of other car council carbon reduction projects and the positive efforts being made by residents and groups in North Somerset to reduce their own carbon footprint. The principle of the current bypass and the project as a whole has not been publicly consulted on, only the route options for the new road. To include the project in the draft local plan with no evaluation or feasibility study, no full transport equalities, health impact and environmental assessments, and no assessment of its carbon costs seems wrong and undemocratic. A full review of the Banwell Bypass project and its carbon cost is overdue. I ask the executive to re recommend this now, please, without further delay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will refer that to the relevant executive member's accounts, Steve Bridger. I also understand that you have referred this to our scrutiny function, and I think they have replied. I have indeed received a letter. Unfortunately, it sidelines all the points that I made. Okay. Uh, we cannot, you cannot delegate it to your contractors. It is a responsibility of the council okay. and the executive to go ahead okay. with this, this, this project. Thank so, you very so much. Thank you, for, thank you for asking that. Thank you. So we now move on to item number two, which is apologies for absence. Um, I can see all of the executive here, so I presume there are no apologies. And I can also see... A non Assistant Executive Member Robert Payne as well. I think um, Nicola Holland may be joining us online. She's not here physically. Okay, thank you. So item three is declaration of disclosable pecuniary interests. Colleagues, are there any? I see none. Um, item four is the minutes from the 8th of December. A particularly windy day, I seem to recall. Are we happy to accept those as a True and correct record. Mike Bell is, is proposing. Anybody seconding? Uh, Mark Canniford. All those in favour of adoption? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Um, item number five is non-executive council's addresses. We have one from uh, Stuart McQuillan, and I believe that Stuart is here in a virtual way. Stuart, come in, please. Uh, thank you. Um I will try and be brief. I Can we all hear Stuart? Am I heard? Yeah, lovely. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so, thank you. So, to members of the executive, um, I'm here today to comment briefly on the preferred options document that you have on the agenda and you're looking to put out for consultation as part of the development of the local plan. I'd like to comment briefly on the document as a whole and then talk a little bit about the specific proposal to allocate housing in the Yanley Woodspring Golf Course area of Long Ashton, whom I represent. Uh, firstly, um, I'd really like to, to put on record to thank the officers for their hard work in this report and all the consultation workshops with members and parish councils that they've held in the development of it. Uh, the council is in a a pretty difficult position regarding housing, but I think consultation is important and I hope that that consultation uh, continues as the local plan evolves. Um, turning to the proposed options document itself, again, I think it, it's a good job. It does a good job of setting out a complicated picture, the council's position, the steps taken to date and, and going forward. It's strong on the climate emergency and active travel, which I personally welcome, won't surprise you, being a member of the Green Party. Uh, my one point of hopefully constructive criticism at the strategic level is I don't think the nature emergency is prominent enough at the moment, um, nor are the requirements for biodiversity net gain. And if possible, I'd like officers to, to look at that uh, again in due course, and I'm happy to help if that's appropriate or that's wanted. Uh, turning to my, my local sort of ward, with my ward hat on, um, regarding the, the Yanley area proposal, first of all, again, yeah, welcome the fact that these Numbers wise is much less than the speculative proposal from Taylor Wimpy some years ago. The numbers are still high. I'm sure you will all understand uh, the, the ripples of concern going through Long Ashton at the moment. 
face of the development of another village of similar size to their own in very close proximity. I'm sure you'll get plenty of comments from the residents I represent in due course if assuming this goes forward to consultation. However, on the positive side, I'm very happy and I think I can speak for most of my residents as well to see clear green space between the proposed new settlement and Long Ashton itself. And that's very important to Long Ashton's village identity. So I hope that is something that remains in place as the plan matures. Still very concerned about the impact on services, although I note some of the wording in the local plan, sorry, proposed preferred options document already addresses this. But there is definitely going to be concerns and issues around traffic mitigation measures, provision of school places, which is already a struggle. Uh, we only just about um, managed to meet all our need at uh, primary and we struggle with secondary uh, very often. Healthcare provision is also an issue. I mean, we all think we all know how difficult it is sometimes to get GP appointments. So no surprises there. But I just really want to make the point. That I think that's the issues that will probably come out from the residents I represent. So I'll finish with just two, two pleas to the executive, if I may. Please keep the, the close stakeholder dialogue going, um, particularly with Long Ashton residents and Parish Council, as we are receiving potentially up to 10% of overall housing. I think we need to be seen as key stakeholders as this plan matures. I think we need to be listened to, along with everyone else, of course. And please, please resist where you can the inevitable pressure for Taylor Wimpy to increase the numbers back to the original Vale proposal, which was unsuitable, proposing three different villages with much higher housing numbers. And final plea, should government policy change or formula change, I hope I can be reassured that settlements such as this on the Green Belt and also others in other parts of North Somerset will be the first ones to be reviewed and the numbers adjusted. Many thanks for the opportunity to address you. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you for being so eloquent in your, in your comments. Uh, we will certainly take those on board. And we now move on to item number six. Matters referred to the executive and not dealt with elsewhere on this agenda. I believe there are none. There are none. Um, the same for West of England sub-region items not dealt with any elsewhere on the agenda. None. The forward plan, a supplementary dispatch was sent out with the papers. That's for noting. Are we happy to note? Are there any comments, questions? Jeff Richardson. Uh, thanks, Don. Um, I was just interested. I spotted the thing in there about greenhouse gas capture. I don't know if anybody can actually enlighten us a little bit more about what's going on there. Steve Bridger. Yeah, very briefly. I think that's that relates to um, a something we're exploring with with base. Um, potentially around the Banwell bypass, um, but there's some to and fro at the moment with the with that with the, that government department about about that in particular. But we're, we're keen to make a bid around carbon capture ca carbon capture as part of that scheme. Okay, thanks, Steve. That sounds uh, like good news, basically. Thank you, Jeff. Any other comments, questions? Are we happy to note it, colleagues? Yes. Okay, now we'll move on to the substantive part of the agenda. I think because of, there's some pretty meaty stuff here, and to make it, certainly if people are watching online, so we get the, the main items out first. The agenda will now go in the, in the order of 9, 14, 15, 16, 17, 11, 12, 13, 10, and 18. Thank you very much. So we've got, well, the item number 9 is the local, local North Somerset plan. And you're going to present that, Mark? I am, thank you, Chairman. Um, if I can just, if you can just indulge me for a moment. Uh, after one failed attempt, I am pleased to bring the local plan draft proposals forward. These are called the preferred options, which can now go out to our communities, developers and businesses to consult on. I'd like to, at this point, thank officers for the huge amount of work that has been done in this uh, and the way they've consulted and talked to, to members throughout the process. At this point, Chairman, I would like to give uh, notice for an amendment, which I will come on to in a bit. Also, there is an additional document into, to be added to the preferred options document, which is the uh, land fronting Drove Road uh, for um, uh, community use, which we have omitted from the plan, but it needs to go back in. So that will be put forward with those preferred documents as well. 
We have already done the challenges and choices consultation over the last two years, and we are now ready to move forward to the next stage. Let's be clear, these choices will challenge us. They will challenge us all to make really tough decisions in the next coming months. And as we have said all the way through this, we simply cannot say, not in my backyard. That simply will not suffice. We have worked with members to find these possible solutions, but there are two main considerations. Any sites removed will have to be replaced elsewhere. And if we don't make the allocated numbers, the likelihood is the inspectorate, government inspectorate, will approve any requests from developers to build on site anyway. Therefore, we end up with the buildings and we lose control. Those two must be considered in any discussions that we move forward. I have heard it said by one of our MPs in North Somerset that these figures are simply a guide, the 20,085 houses. However, he will not confirm this on writing to him, and he simply will not respond to those requests for confirmation in Westminster. I assume this is Mr. Fox has no influence in Westminster any longer. Let's not forget that we are being blackmailed over these housing numbers, which are much higher than the previous levels, and it, we will find it very difficult to achieve 20,085 homes. We don't, if we don't, it is very clear that developers will take advantage of this and put in speculative applications, and this will ultimately be decided by our government planning inspectorate, of course. We must also work with our national planning policy frameworks, or within them. But we do intend to find the full allocation of housing during this process. The amendment I would like to make, and I'm sure members will be really pleased to hear, is that we will be seeking 40% affordable housing within this, this document. We currently look for 30. We are moving up to 40. And this is an aspiration of this whole administration. This needs to be tested, but it is ambitious, and we will be trying to achieve this. We also have 12 strategic policies within this proposal, which all have detailed policies under them. And there is where we need councillors and members of the public to engage, because these are those issues that Councillor McWilliam were talking about around climate, na climate and national nature emergencies which have to be considered and can be considered through those policies. The position we find ourselves in is not perfect and we wish the government would give us more reasonable targets, Chairman, but this administration takes this challenge seriously and it must be said that we are not happy with developing in places like the Green Belt but this seems preferable to building people's homes on the floodplains. But we have tried to create a workable local plan. We can propose suggestions and amendments to these current proposals, so please encourage residents to engage in this process and make alternative suggestions. If they are better, we will adopt. It is proposed that this consultation will run from the 14th of March to the 29th of April. And uh, if members have any questions today, Chairman uh, Michael Reap and Richard Kent are with us to answer those. But thank you uh, very much, and please support this preferred option document to go out to consultation uh, for comments from our communities. Thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, thank you, Mark. Um, did you mention that you wanted to put an amendment into this? Yes, the amendment, Chairman, was that we are proposing 40% affordable housing targets within the local plan, moving up from the 30 that we currently have. Okay. This will have to be tested through the process, but that is our ambition and that's what we would like to achieve. Okay, so you're proposing that. Do I find a seconder? Is that you, Councillor Petty? Okay. So, Chairman, could I just check with officer colleagues as well? I understood that you were adding in another amendment as well. Can, can that be put on the table now? I think we did say that was being added, uh, the land fronting drove road roundabout, so that needs to be added to the preferred document as well. So that's another amendment. So okay. I've got land fronting drove road roundabout as a, a primary school. As an addition. And a Western Supermare Rugby, Western Rugby Club. 
Same thing, I think. So All the same, same place, yeah. Thank okay, you. and we've got an amendment around the 40% affordable housing. So the first thing we need to vote on is whether the amendment... Uh, uh, yes? Yeah, so... Okay, so are we happy to happy to support those amendments? Okay. Yeah, we're going to, we're going to debate next. So okay. So we've now so we've not, we're now we're now do we have a proposal for the amended motion? Then we're going to a debate. Mark Canford, a seconder. Councillor Cartman, lovely. Thank you. So we're open to debate. So, thanks. Are there any, are there any comments from officers before I open up to members? Okay, fine. I've got the first person that had their hand up I could see in real life was John Crockford Hawley. Gerald. Uh, thank, thank you, Leader. Um, one request first. I wonder if those members who are with us at distance and on camera would like to switch off their cameras. It, it, it's very disconcerting looking at three faces staring at us um, from afar. Um, almost there. Um, Leader, I, I suspect few members of the public realize the council has a scrutiny system whereby policies such as this enormous local plan are not simply adopted via the executive but are subject to full cross-party examination mm. and if found wanting are and will be returned to the executive for reappraisal. As chairman of the place scrutiny panel, I'm helped and at times challenged by a vice chairman not of my own party and a small cohort of cross-party colleagues who meet regularly to discuss officer-led ideas, put forward their own concerns and proposals and listen to the representations and views of those from outside, including the public. Leader, we've encountered some challenging working issues this past two years, insofar as most of our deliberations have been of COVID necessity at distance and not in public. We've been working tirelessly, and though I think we've made reasonably effective use of screen time, there's been little ability to sit informally bouncing ideas off one another. And of course, there's been little opportunity, and this is the worrying point, to do so in public. Uh, this is something which I'm going to ask my scrutiny colleagues to consider when we meet formally and in person in this very chamber on Monday. Um, I would like to thank colleagues from all parties, including the Chairman of the Planning and Regulatory Committee who engaged with the scrutiny process, but I do so with a slight reservation because some councillors have made absolutely no effort to voice any interest, let alone express public concern about what will be without doubt a document of such far-reaching consequence that many of us won't be alive to witness its long-term consequences. We're not master in our own house, as the executive member has said. Government dictates the rules, and we are obliged to jump in obedience, like it or not. So we must get it right. This local plan will not, indeed it cannot, please everyone, and in the process it will anger many, but complete it we must. There is no alternative. I simply ask that we allow ourselves a situation where the voice of the people can be heard properly and effectively in what hopefully is going to become a somewhat easier uh, way in which we can engage. Thank, thank you, Leader. Thank you, John. And yeah, let's also note, of course, this is to approve this, this um, document for public consultation as well. So we're asking the public, businesses, residents, organisations with North Somerset to comment on the future up to 2038. And as John quite already says that sadly quite a few of the people here today may well not witness 2038. But... Um, I will 
I'd like also just to say now, in light of what John has just said, before I open our other colleagues, to thank our officer colleagues within the planning team because the amount of work they've put into this is immeasurable, I think. The fact they've listened to so many different people and put together this document, I think, pays tribute to, the, to, to what, what is a pretty, a pretty um, select team, shall I say, and the fact they've managed to produce such a, such a strong document, in my opinion, you know, with, with, with that in mind. Thank you very much. No two of them are here, but they are only part of that team. And I hope you, you'll take back our thanks as a council to your team. So thank you. Um, our next person I've got wants to speak is Mike Bell. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and, and thank you to officers and, and Councillor Canniford for the, the local plan report. Um, there's just three things that I wanted to say. So the first one is I really welcome the aspirations around delivering more affordable uh, homes. Uh, it's um, in, the, in, in the context of North Somerset, we've always struggled actually to deliver enough affordable homes as part of our local planning process. Um, the current position is 30%. Uh, the draft document had 35%. Um, Councillor Canniford has now pushed that to, to 40%, and that's really welcome. And I think we should set the highest possible aspirations that we can and be ambitious in delivering the affordable homes for rent and for ownership that people um, in North Somerset need. There are numerous stories at the moment about uh, soaring house prices, the, the growing gap between what is affordable uh, and uh, what is out there in the market. And we know that it's a real challenge for, for young people and families across North Somerset. So we do need to do more. And I'm pleased to say that we will be even more ambitious as part of our own development program on land which we own uh, to make sure that we do deliver more affordable homes um, uh, over the next uh, 15 years. So I, I really strongly um, welcome that. That sort of leads me on to the second point, which is it is, of course, easy and tempting uh, in this debate to focus on how we don't want all of these houses built and all the places where we don't want them to be built. But I think it is important to recognise that we do actually need to build more houses. You know, we have people who are on the housing waiting list who are not able to access uh, accommodation. We've got a big affordability gap in, in large parts of North Somerset between average earnings and the cost of, of houses to rent and to buy. So we do need to build more homes. We are a growing area. Our population is growing. People want to come and live in and work in North Somerset. So it is important that we deliver more homes um, fit for the future. But that leads me to the third point, which is to just entirely echo that the people best placed to make decisions about where we build homes and the types of homes that we build are local people here in North Somerset and their elected representatives. And it is incredibly frustrating uh, that the process is totally driven by government national policies uh, and by government diktat. We all know that we can make the good decisions that are needed for the people of North Somerset and our future. But we can't do that if we're constantly having our hands tied behind our backs in terms of the, the, the targets that are set by government, the threat of enforcing uh, national policies and allowing speculative developers to run, uh, run, run rampant uh, across North Somerset. So, my plea to the government today, as a day when they are announcing their levelling up white paper and they're talking about their long-term ambitions, much of which we would all agree with, is to free up uh, local government and to free up local communities to make the right decisions for their areas so that we can respond to the kinds of legitimate concerns and feedback that we have had uh, from communities during the earlier phases of the local plan consultation and we can get the right decisions, good, locally informed, evidence-led decisions for North Somerset and not those ones dreamt up in Whitehall by people who know absolutely nothing about our community. Thank you. Uh, Terry Porter. Oh, thank you, Leader. It was just well, two points, really. Um, it's very laudable to sort of go from 30 to 35 to 40. I'd be interested if one of the planning officers could tell me what we achieve at the moment, because the last I saw, it was around 12%, which is, uh, you know, way, way down from what we would want to see. The difficulty is, unfortunately, at the moment, the developers will come in with a plan. I've sat in inquiries in here when they've lauded they're going to do uh, 30%. When we get the planning application in, they come back and they say, unfortunately, the cost of the land now is so much, we can't deliver that, you'll get 10%. And we don't have the power to do this. It's nice to make it 40%. I don't honestly think that's going to be a, a realistic change to put it up very much. And just the other thing I would just say is, um, 
You heard one gentleman uh, from the public make a report earlier. It is, uh, we will get a considerable response from some of the neighbourhoods where there are sites on here that we have turned down on a number of occasions, have gone to inquiry and been turned down, and we're now suggesting that perhaps we might want to include them. So I do hope we listen to the public when they make a response and not just, uh, you know, ignore it and go back with what it is. I, I appreciate this is a challenge. You know, when we were here a couple of years ago, we looked at it and we felt this was unjust. And we started off with 17,000, and we get, kept getting pushed up more and more. And it is a challenge. I don't think we'll ever achieve any of this, because it's not in our power to do it. And I know we would like to see the ability to be able to set figures that we can deliver. It's dependent on the developers. So I do appreciate the challenge there is with this. Um, but I just, you know, and I will support as much as I can with it. But I think you will get some public responses. And I think we just need to be very careful that we do listen to them. Thank you, Leo. Thank you. Um, I've got um, Catherine Gibbons. I'll take that off for a second. Thank you. Um, yes, like everyone else, I thank the officers and everybody who's been involved in producing this document, and I welcome the increase uh, in the amount of affordable housing. I, I share what Councillor Porter is saying, being concerned that we actually managed to deliver that. And of course, as I'm often asked by residents, you know, to clarify what exactly do we mean by affordable? Affordable for whom? Because quite often what we call affordable housing is out of reach of many people. And I also hope that we can find the um, ability to create houses that are flexible in the sense that they are e easily used by older people but also families with dis disabled children or with mobility issues because some of our housing is really unsuitable for those groups. And just to go back to what Councillor Cropford Hawley was saying about making sure that our residents and the public engage with this and remembering what uh, the leader just said about the age of some of the people here and out there not being around in 2038. I would just like to ask if we can find a way to engage with young people on this because I recently, well, the other yesterday in fact, attended the first meeting of North Somerset's Youth Parliament and one of the areas those young people highlighted as a concern was housing and where they were going to live in the future and how they were going to travel, how they were going to work. So I genuinely think if we're talking about a plan that goes as far as 2038, we should be finding a way to talk to young people, to get out into schools, explain this policy and ask them what they feel because this is their lives as much as it is ours. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've got Anne Harley online. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Leader. Um, yes, it's very interesting listening from here, and I'm sorry I can't be in there, but uh, I hope you can hear me. But the fact is, I think Councillor Caniford um, is only quoting, and as alluded to by Councillor Porter, the very real problems the previous administration went uh, through. Um, and I would also say that um, it is driven uh, because of need, but I've got a real concern um, that in the consultations, uh, and representing a rural area, uh, I put a lot of uh, faith in it, is we do not take note of what is in the Localism Act. And it's never referred to. But in that Localism Act, it does state very clearly that we ought to take in the concerns. And they did actually mention um, the neighbourhood plans, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We ought to take into consideration the things that are said there, because, as I think was alluded to by Councillor Crockford Hawley, and he knows very well that I'm, I am emailing him. I do thank him for um, allowing me to um, send my points of view to him, and there's a few more to go to him as well. But I do feel that we have to engage with these people. I think Councillor Canford mentioned a uh, floodplain. Well, I think Western Supermare sits on a floodplain, so we wouldn't have any houses in Western Supermare. And the other thing I'm concerned about is affordable housing. I agree. I totally agree. But does anybody really feel that the amount of materials and stuff that's being used and will be following the COVID and anything else, that affordable housing is going to be able to be delivered. And that's a real concern. I really do feel 
that, um, yes, we're talking about 2038 and not many of us will be around. And I take on board um, what, um, you know, Councillor Gibbons said about um, taking into the view of young people. It, it is important, but that's exactly what we are trying to do, sort of in the rural areas, because we've lost all our young people in the rural areas because there's no work. There's absolutely no work. So they have to travel. But I think we've got to be extremely careful how we go down this route. And we've really got to listen. Thank you, Anne. Thank you for your comments. I've got Councillor Ash Cartman. Thank you, Leader. So North Somerset, as colleagues have said, has been told by government that it needs to find space for 20,000 new homes. That's a huge increase, a 20% increase in what we've got together, the size of two new Clevedons. Now, I am supportive, actually, of the government's aim to build more houses. We have a housing crisis in the UK, um, so I really do want to see more house building. We really need to build more. Um, I'm supportive of more homes in North Somerset, too, but this number is simply ridiculous. It's ridiculous given the constraints we have here in the district. We have a significant amount of greenbelt, an, an area of outstanding natural beauty, and large areas of low-lying land susceptible to flooding. We shouldn't be building on any of them. This leads me to conclude that this number can only have been produced by some mutant algorithm on a back office computer in Whitehall with no thought before it became published and given to us to implement. But we have to accommodate these numbers, as others have said, and many residents have asked me why we can't simply say no. Why can't we just refuse to accommodate this increase? But sadly, the reality of not having a plan is worse than the proposals we have in front of us today. We are stuck between the devil and the deep blue sea. By refusing to prepare a local plan, we would not only end up with this housing growth anyway, but this council, your council, would lose any ability to influence where housing growth occurs in the district. And it's for this reason I will absolutely be voting to support this consultation plan and the amendment put forward by my colleague to increase the affordable housing ratio. I'd like to make some quick remarks about my own area, if I may, um, because my area of Long Ashton is where uh, 2,500 new homes are proposed. Um, in particular, I'd like, I really would like to thank council staff and my executive colleague Mark Hannaford and his predecessor James Tonkin for the hours and hours of meetings and discussions they've had with me, some of them being quite challenging over the last 12 to 18 months as I've sought to represent my residents. And I really do feel they've been productive as reflected in this report because I'm pleased that the consultation does not propose development in either Raxall or Fayland, and this will come as a great relief to many of my local residents. But I'm also pleased that we are signalling our desire for the 2,500 homes proposed near Long Ashton to be a separate village with its own services and its own sustainable transport links. This is really important, and it's good news. It should be a village that will not, will not be an extension of Bristol, but a new, vibrant community in its own right. So I will continue to represent my residents over the coming months, and I look forward to continuing meeting with officers uh, and with my executive colleague, Mark, and I hope we can arrange a time for a public meeting to be held in my ward, as there's a lot of desire for it from my residents. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've got Steve Bridger. Thank you, Chairman. I'll be relatively brief, and I, I won't repeat the comments that um, colleagues have made about the unattainable housing numbers. I wanted really to draw people's attention to what I think are an awful lot of really positive, a lot of positive intent that's tucked away in the emerging policies. Um, it's a really chunky local plan. Um, I would encourage people to, to, to read it. Um, you know, as others have said, that the, the, the issue is, is obviously about the, 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 the numbers themselves, but also about type and affordability of the houses that are built. I think that's absolutely critical to me. Um, there are far too many larger homes being built where the need is actually for smaller homes that people can afford to live in, uh, you know, plain and simple. My hope is that obviously we're, we're going out for hopefully for public consultation. Obviously house builders themselves will also be, will respond to that consultation. My hope is that they respond to the, you know, to, to what, we've, what we're expressing in, the, in that policy framework wrapped around, wrapped around this local plan. I think there are 29 references to the, uh, to the word viability in the plan. I think that, again, is absolutely key. Come, come the time, I hope, as a council, we can be really robust 
in, in challenging house builders who inevitably will, will, will come back and say uh, X, Y, X, Y, Z isn't, isn't viable. I hope that we can be really, really challenging uh, back when it comes to testing that out. Um, we will do our best as a council, as, as Councillor Bell said. We're actually doing that where we actually have greater freedom uh, to bring forward imaginative solutions ourselves. So that's effectively on land that we, we own ourselves. We will look to, to go over and above what the market is actually bringing forward. We've started to do that. Finally, as, and as an aside, you know, I, I do wonder what the end point will be. I mean, th this current local plan process is demonstrating very clearly, you know, just, just how little land there is left uh, in North Somerset without the constraints of the Greenbelt, AOMB and, and, the, and the floodplain. And without wanting to give officers, you know, a heart attack, you know, I'm thinking, hey, what, what about the, the local plan after this, this one? You know, I have no idea where we're going to continue to put those houses, but um, I'll, I'll leave it for there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Nigel Ashton. Thank you. Um, I totally agree with the comments on the ludicrous numbers of being imposed on us. We've been arguing that for, for, for years. Um, it's just totally undoable and, and putting houses in, on the edge of floodplains or even in floodplains we, we've been having to do. So I totally support that. The problem with putting up the, the uh, quotient of number of affordable houses from e even to 30, let alone 35 and 40, was always that then the, uh, the negotiations with the developers meant that you didn't get any other services provided in that location. Um, and, and as we go looking for more and more sites to put any sort of uh, housing, uh, those facilities become more and more important, but you won't get them paid for by the developers as we used to. Um, I, I often think that perhaps we ought to look at reducing the number of affordable housing in a, in a development and actually making them truly affordable because for a long time we've used that term affordable and we all know, we all qualify it now and say, well, it's not truly affordable. So, so let's make the, if we have to have the houses, let's make it uh, affordable for the developers to actually provide truly affordable but quality houses and some local services. Just putting up the target 4040, it's easy for them to um, show that actually it's not doable. Thank you. So I think everybody wanted to speak. Oh, Bridget. Thank you. I know that many people have contrib contributed many different things this afternoon, and, and many of them have been really um, strong and well-made points. I'd like to thank Councillor Canniford for reminding us that we are being blackmailed by this government, that we are worse than between a rock and a hard place. This is a process, and this is part of a broken system. This is a failure of successive governments to address affordability. I don't agree with some colleagues that say that we need to build more housing. We need to build some, but this is based on the wrong rhetoric from my mind and from the point of view of the Green Party. It is built on a system of profits over people. And, and as Councillor Ashton just said, communities have been reliant on build the houses to provide the community services. This again is part of a very broken system community services should not have to rely on house building. And I welcome the changes and the proposal for higher affordability, affordable housing. Um, and I think that there's work been done by other councils to make sure that that viability has been proven and brought to the public domain so that, so that uh, developers can't just whimsically say it can't be done. And I think that other councils are holding them to account. So I'd ask our officers to, to kind of look to other councils to see how they've addressed that and Bristol being one of them. I approach this paper in a very difficult situation because I come with two hats on. I am the executive member for the climate emergency and I am also the elected member for Backwell. Backwell has been, has been sandwiched between two very large proposals. But first I'll respond on the climate emergency. What I'd like to point out is that this draft local plan has done a lot of positive work um, and has a huge amount of thought and boundary pushing has gone into the policies on climate change. I know that our officers have worked closely with neighbouring authorities to do this. Our ambition as a council is reflected in these new policies. We are clearly placing a lot of importance on embedded carbon, suitable 
locations and active travel. And I'm proud of the work that the Green councillors have done, both with the scrutiny panels and with the executive members and officers to push on that net zero and that uh, response to the climate emergency. So when it comes out for consultation, and that's what I believe is the, the, the best next step in this process, I would urge people to look to those policies and comment and feedback, because there is a lot of good work in that place. When I think of Backwell and the response that I've had from community members, the words disappointed, concern, fear come to mind. They are being asked, would we rather protect a, a protected species for bats area or would we rather protect Greenbelt? This is not an easy situation to put Backwell in and at the moment it's a uh, it's more than just a transport hub and a transport location. And it feels like there are additional questions to be asked on how, on how this document is really viable and what is needed and what is desired. So with regards to transport, I do want to make sure that we keep that the ambition through the next version and that when developers come, developments come through, they cannot, can be no watering down. For example, a potential alternative multimodal route between Nailsey and the A370 must be secondary to active and public travel, and any environmental recommendations must be carried out. So I think, although this is a point in time in a process, and I respect the fact that this is a process, there are still many questions to be asked and many challenges to be faced. But I welcome the fact that it is a consultation, and the community have their right and their chance to now comment on that. Thank you. Mark, are you going to sum up? Just to quickly sum up, uh, I just would like to say Council Cropped Hawley is uh, spot on when it, in, in terms of engagement and it's essential that uh, he, his colleagues and panels challenge me, challenge the officers uh, throughout this whole process because we now have uh, the preferred options document to move forward with and, and that does need, quite right, you need to be challenged, to be seen to be challenged as well, not just uh, a case of talking. And, and I'm with Councillor Bell all the way. We do need more homes. What does affordable mean? We can continually have that discussion, but we do need, at some stage, through our housing, our housing strategy, to work out what we believe that is, because we, we can all say what is affordable. What's affordable to one isn't affordable to another. But we do know people need homes, and many can't afford them. So I will continue on that vein because I am ambitious to get people into homes uh, who simply can't afford full prices. I do, however, recognise that, Councillor Porter, I do recognise that we must listen to people. We can't simply just push these things over, but we do have to achieve numbers, as you have quite rightly said. Um, and uh, I think there is clearly an issue in North Somerset, and I think Councillor Ashton alluded to this, around land values, and it makes it very difficult in some places to achieve a ho uh, affordable housing, but much easier in other areas due to those land values. So I would uh, like to see support for this local plan preferred options. Thank you, Chair. Okay, so we have um, proposed and seconded amended motion, so I'm going to go to the vote. All those in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you, colleagues. Okay, now I, so I'm going to I've changed the agenda around. So I, I think Councillor Carp is leading on items 14, 15, 16, and 17. I believe he's going to speak to all four at the same time. Do you want to speak now, Councillor Carp? Or do you want to go through the, the process of the. No, I'll speak now. That's all right. Yep, so thank you. I'll speak to all four. They're quite um, lengthy papers. Um, and then after, take, ask Amy to come in, our Section 151 officer. Um, after I've spoken generally, and then we will go through, obviously, the recommendations of each paper in turn, but uh, I think it would be more efficient to make general comments about the whole lot. Um, this, this council, to me, is run on three words, three words that guide everything we do, everything we want to do, three words that signal our intent and set our ambition, open, fair, green. And it's these three little words that underpin everything in these reports. It is in these four reports, in the 263 pages of text, tables, and appendices, that these three words find their true meaning. Meaning as we protect and enhance our basic services, meaning as we back our children and young people for a better future, and meaning as we invest in our towns and villages, and meaning as we act in response to the climate emergency. At its very essence, though, our budget for the year ahead is one of protection and investment. 
It protects the essential services we all rely on and invests for a better future for all of us in North Somerset. We already have ambitious investment programme with over £300 million committed to local projects. Today we announce our intention to increase that by a further £40 million. £40 million to improve services for children, to fund green initiatives and to invest in improving local facilities and infrastructure. Backing our children and young people is at the core of what this council wants to do. We want to make childhood fairer for everyone, especially those who are vulnerable, disadvantaged or have special educational or additional needs. A fair start means an equal start. That's why we're committing money to support our children and young people, and this includes increasing the budget available to support families with disabled children by almost half a million pounds, allocating an additional 1.1 million pounds to support our improvement plan for children's social care and children with special educational needs and disabilities. And there's also three million pounds to maintain and improve our schools, part of which will be to investing so that we can uh, aid the provision of better mental health support services in schools across the district. Finally, play areas across North Somerset will also benefit. Last year, significant investments in our marine lakes and public rights of way were announced. This year, we're announcing a million pound plus outside investment programme for the young. From toddler to teenager, having somewhere to go, something to do, somewhere to exercise is essential to a healthy life and upbringing. So that's why we're announcing that our own play areas will benefit from a £300,000 initial investment next year with £150,000 per annum to follow in each of the next four years. And we won't just be replacing existing equipment, we want to make sure that every child in North Somerset has a play area that they can use. We will take particular care to develop play areas in strategic locations that are accessible to all. Next year, we're also setting aside £250,000 to offer as much funding to town and parish councils and other community groups, helping them to invest in their own play areas or skate parks. And this is a really good example of us working in partnership with local communities, sharing resources, improving facilities for all our residents. Now, making the changes necessary to build a sustainable future for all our residents is hard. And we know that councils across the UK, resources are stretched and solutions are difficult. There are no easy answers, but we must act. Building a greener North Somerset is a mammoth task, and this council is committed to play its part. That's why we've set aside £7 million over the next five years to invest in tackling and responding to the climate emergency. Over 1 million will be invested in active travel schemes, 1 million in supporting low emission vehicle provision, 2 million on sea defences, and next year alone we're going to put aside £300,000 to purchase strategic plots of land across the district to help deliver biodiversity net gain. But we should be careful not to silo these green initiatives, not to think of them as separate and discrete items, as green considerations are running through the veins of every decision that this council makes. From the renewal of our energy contract, contracts next year, where we, we are already undertaking detailed assessments of the green credentials of suppliers, to the building of Winterstoke 100 Academy announced recently, a £30 million plus project which will be our first net zero school when it opens. We are successfully embedding green considerations into each and every decision that we make. As fellow councillors know, if you speak to any of your residents, what they want to see most from the council is more investment in their local area, in their town, their village, their community. That's why these reports contain a whole raft of measures to invest in and improve our physical environment. Last year, we announced a £300,000 investment as part of our public rights of way improvement plan. And this has been an opportunity again for us to work with our local and town and parish councils who have helped us to identify schemes for investment. And building on this, we propose a further 400,000 over the next few years to fund further projects. And we also want to invest in our cycle paths. Soon we will see the completion of the peer-to-peer -peer route between Weston and Clevedon. But we want to go further. We want to extend the Strawberry Line all the way from Yatton to Clevedon. This is an ambitious project, and over the next year we will be putting funds aside for a detailed feasibility study. Our towns and villages will also benefit. This year, Weston will benefit from the National Sea Monster event, and to accompany this, we'll be making further improvements on the seafront, including new lighting and refurbished shelters. 
We also want to see action on the Tropicana and have put aside funds accordingly. Further afield, all our towns will benefit from, from further investment. In addition to the things mentioned already, we'll be bringing forward plans to secure the long-term site for Nailsey Library and also investing in other libraries in the region. And we're currently uh, revising our placemaking strategy for Clevedon. So after years of falling funding, protecting the basic services that our residents rely upon has been and will continue to be very difficult. Yet this is what we have done, protecting and investing the facilities and services that bind our communities together. Top of this list, of course, is social care. The imminent health and social care levy makes no contribution to these rising costs. Cost increases all councils across the UK are experiencing and struggling to cope with. Nonetheless, we have found an additional £8.7 million to address pressures in this area. Additional funding to make sure that we continue to look after vulnerable members of our community in their moment of need. This is a significant increase and is more than all of the extra revenue we will receive from raising council tax. The collection of waste is also a core service that residents rely on. And after the successful um, in bring, bringing our green waste collections in-house this year, I'm pleased to announce a £20 million plus investment programme over the next five years. This £8.5 million for a new waste depot, £13 million for new state-of-the-art vehicles, and a raft of improvements at our three recycling centres in Backwell, Portishead and Weston. All this while at the same time making no increase to next year's green bin charge. Finally, roads. Over the past three years, including central government contributions, we have spent £31 million on our local roads, maintaining them and making sure they are fit for purpose for all road users, um, sorry, car drivers and cyclists. Over the next three years, we plan to spend a further £32 million. And to maintain our steady state policy, next year we will be doubling our own investment to £2.5 million as a direct result of reduced funding from government. So, these reports together constitute the Council's budget and financial strategy for the coming year. The key question, though, many residents will ask is, how much is my Council tax increasing? The answer is simple, 2.99%. This is the increase you'll be asking Council to approve later this month. 2.99% is below inflation and, rec and, rec and recognising the cost of living pressures on residents, not something that we would ever do lightly. The reality for residents is that all the money raised by this increase, though, is not even enough to fund the gap in funding for social care. Together, these reports show that the Council is committed to developing a robust and sustainable budget, a revenue, treasury and capital strategy that protects services and invests for our future. I'd like to hand over to Amy Webb now, our Section 151 officer, but before I do, I, before I do I'd like to thank Amy and the finance team and everyone else across the Council. This has been a collective effort in an exceptionally hard year um, to put this budget together. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cartman. So, uh, obviously, to confirm that the Council has a responsibility to set a balanced budget for the coming year, and so I can conclude that a robust budget is being proposed through these papers, having considered the cost and demand pressures faced across many service areas. So this will allow the council to maintain and support existing services, as well as investing in the long-term capital projects, which Councillor Cartman has just described. The recommended budget also includes significant sums of new money into the adult social care budgets to address existing pressures, which are not all fully funded by the government. Uh, such as the health and social care levy and national insurance increase, which I'm sure you're all aware of, um, including also the national minimum wage rise, which is due. There's also investment being made in children's services to secure improvement and achieve better outcomes for our young people, as well as additional funding being prioritised to address the increasing demand for home to school transport service. So whilst the budget for 22-23 represents a comparatively low level of savings, we'll be able to meet the budget gap and it has been a challenging process because um, importantly, there's considerable amount of uncertainty about future funding. So we'll need to find further savings in the future throughout the MTFP period. So North Somerset has a good track record of delivering services and savings. However, we need to ensure that our revenue and capital budgets are sustainable over the medium term and take a cautious approach, approach to risk we will need to plan for further 
funding challenges. I can confirm that the budget presented in these papers is robust if the Council is minded to approve a total increase of the precept to 2.99% and that reserves levels have been assessed as adequate to meet the risks which have been identified at this stage in the planning process and as identified in the papers. I'd also like to thank all members of the Council who have been um, involved in this process and officers which have been engaged in preparing the detail behind the budget. Thank you. Thank you. I was going to take questions about all these four items from members. I'm not aware of any amendments that are going to be proposed to any of them. Okay, thank you. So we'll go through that. I have a pre-advised question from John Cato. Thank you, Chair. I uh, appreciate that very much. Um, as this is really for information. So... Um, as chair of the audit committee, um, the Treasury Management Strategy Report was presented to the audit committee last Thursday, the 27th of January, and we did note it as recommended. I want to appreciate and thank our officers for their good work on this, and I also appreciate the improvements that have been made in communicating complex information. We are assured we are fully code compliant and operating within all the prescribed boundaries. Just to advise members, while the audit committee can assure you we have no reason to believe the report is inaccurate in any way, we do have concerns around fund performance and outstanding questions about how the strategy is implemented with respect to A, investment assets, governance, selection criteria, performance objectives, benchmarking, monitoring, and the criteria for triggering, triggering remedial action, and B, greater clarity around the liability benchmark, borrowing, and inflation risk management. To this end, we are working with the director to see if there's anything further we should and could do. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Um... Ash, did you want to say anything to that? Thanks, John. Yeah, thank, thank you, John. And I, I appreciate that you've uh, acknowledged the, the detailed work that's gone into improving this report uh, and making it more uh, readable for perhaps Absolutely. for lay members. And I think we've made significant yeah, strides. Good. Yeah, and I, I do think having that uh, clarity over the issues you've said is, is very important, and we'll work with that. And I appreciate you said that you're not saying there's any issues, it's more the clarity of what goes around it. I think in terms of fund performance, I think that's it's an interesting question because you do have the benefit of hindsight to some certain extent. And I think if you're looking at fund performance to go back and really the key question is what's the government's right at the time the funds are invested in and we shall absolutely have a, have a look at that. I do think it's important to note that the rules are changing in terms of how those funds and the performance of those funds are accounted for. So my expectation, although I'd probably look to Amy to confirm this, is over the next kind of 12 months we'll be looking to transition away from funds that have capital risks because of the way those will be accounted through on the revenue budget. So it, it may be something that you're interested in but with practical hat on may realise it, it may not be such an issue but I think my, my summary answer is happy to continue working on this to make continued improvements and build upon the good work that's been done to date. Thank you. Thank you. Amy Webb. Thank you Councillor Cato. I um, really appreciate the insight that the Audit Committee has brought to this report and obviously we'll be continuing to work with you to, um, so you can understand and be fully informed about how the strategy will be implemented in practice, um, noting that the Treasury management is a strategy framework for the coming year and how we'd make those decisions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Amy. Um, and I'm, I am pleased to note that there is flexibility in there for um, these kind of conversations and looking into how we deal with things going forward. Thank you. Uh, the next person on my list is Mark Canniford. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, and I'd like to thank Councillor Cartman. Um, thank you for the work you've done, and I know with Amy and the team, um, and so well put in your words. I would like to thank you particularly for the seafront lighting improvements that you have proposed um, and the investment in the amenities on Western Seafront. We expect hundreds of thousands of additional visitors next summer. Uh, and this will be superbly uh, accepted by them and it will go around the country as a really good place to visit and benefit our businesses and our local communities. So thank you for making those announcements today. Thank you. 
And I'd also add thank you for the announcement on children's play areas, because that's the one thing I do get chased up around all the time about the lack of play facilities for, for, for youngsters. Uh, Mike Bell. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And, and just to join the, uh, the Ash Cartman uh, fan club, uh, I, I would completely endorse the comments and, you know, a really strong uh, overview of, of what the budget proposals are for this year. And, and I would defy anybody uh, to, to listen to that and look at the plans and ambitions that we've set out as part of these proposals uh, and not be uh, positive about the future that we're building for North Somerset. Um, and actually, in that vein, I just want to say I think it's important to acknowledge the benefits of the cross-party working that we have seen in the executive and in the administration. Um, we don't always agree with each other on every, every point, but there is lots of good constructive challenge across the different groups. Uh, Lib Dems, independents, uh, Labour and Greens. We bring different skill sets, different experiences, different uh, political priorities to the table. And I think what you see coming out at the end of that uh, is really solid and ambitious um, proposals for, for North Somerset. So I would like to thank all my colleagues, both in the executive and beyond, for, for all their contributions. I just wanted to do a shout out on two things. One is social care. Um, so absolutely, as Councillor Cartman said, Social care uh, has been under enormous pressure over the last couple of years uh, during the COVID pandemic and our staff, um, both within the council and through the community services and the providers that support us, have done an absolutely amazing job. But they've done it without the critical support and investment that they need from government. And unfortunately, despite the rhetoric that we've heard from national government, there has not been the sustained step change in funding for social care that we want to see. From April this year, uh, all of the residents, uh, all the taxpayers of North Somerset will be asked to pay between 200 and 500 pounds more a year in national insurance, not one penny of which will benefit social care uh, in North Somerset. Uh, and, and that is an absolute national scandal. And so we will continue to bang the drum to recognize the amazing work that our social care teams are doing, but also to hold the government to account and to make sure that they do deliver the, the standard of investment and support that people um, uh, need and, and deserve. The other thing I wanted to mention was just in public health. It's often the um, sort of un, unsung hero uh, in, uh, in budget setting because public health often has a, a ring fence budget that's given from government. So it feels sort of semi-detached from the budget making process. But actually, we have published a, last year a really ambitious a health and wellbeing strategy for North Somerset. And in the coming year, we will be investing around half a million pounds more um, in delivering more public health health interventions and again the pandemic if it's taught us anything it's about the vital importance of prevention of getting out there in our communities and promoting the right uh, public health messages enabling families um, and local people to do the right things around healthy eating healthy lifestyles uh, and so on and I'm absolutely delighted that this budget will help us to deliver more in that area narrow health inequalities and build a healthier and happier uh, North Somerset. Thank you. Um, I've got Anne Harley next. <coughs> oh, live from Winscombe, Anne. My thing, well, oh, there it is. Thank you, Leader. Um, well, I'm very pleased that, um, uh, to hear that Mike Bell is very concerned about the social care and everything like that. Uh, I unfortunately couldn't get into a meeting listening to carers, um, but experiencing the situation, um, I could write a book for Councillor Bell if he wishes to hear it. Um, but um, I want to go back to uh, what Councillor Cartman said. First of all, about strawberry line. Uh, I accept what he said about Yatton to Clevedon, and that was in the previous administration's uh, remit we were we were dealing with that and going to go forward with it um but i'm talking about the longer strawberry line uh that's all going through um, my ward um i'd have to say to you councillor cartman that we are not getting the sort of um investment that we should something went wrong i can't tell you what but i've got a good idea I think that we rely very much on, on, on local people and volunteers to try and cope with that line, whereby 
really the maintenance needs to be addressed as well. It's all very well having all these wonderful ideas, but you have got to uh, support it with maintenance because that is very valuable and we cannot rely on the volunteers. The one volunteer that I've got now has just had a stroke and so he won't be coming back. Um, and these are the worries. Ideas are wonderful and where we want to move, but we've got to make sure that we look after them and we've got to make sure that uh, we have the facilities in there. We have, unfortunately, uh, where we have walkers and cyclists work, work together and it doesn't work. It does not work because the cyclists take over and we I've had a load of complaints on that. So we've really got to look at that because there's going to be a serious accident. And I want to go on um, to the green waste. I was very interested to hear this because when I sat at a budget meeting not very long ago, I think I heard, I think it was from probably Lucy Shimali, that they were going to put up the rate five by five pounds. And the look of horror on my face was actually profound. Unfortunately, um, it hasn't gone away. I really do feel that the residents... And certainly in my ward, I haven't had any green waste collection for six weeks. I think that we should be refunding the uh, the people in um, uh, from May and contributed. And in that time, does Cash, uh, Councillor um, Cartman realise the problems that we've had all over that time? And really and truly, the public have not, not had the quality of service that they should have had and to just justify it by saying we're not putting up the uh, fee well if you did you would have had a riot and i think you know we need to look at recompensing those that have had all this problem and i hope that you're going to listen to that and the next thing i heard uh, was about you know dealing and buy buying land for or, you know, parks. Well, I know it's down the road, but can we not engage with farmers? Can we not engage with them to encourage them to do these these sort of schemes? Right on our doorstep out here, we've got the Mender Hills, the most wonderful park in the world, in my opinion. And here I want to know, I couldn't see them in the report, where they're all going. In our village, in my village here, we have a recreation grant which the council pays for because it was actually bought for the people we seem to have lost Dan, so i will refer the comments on the on but the we've got on, the, one up on here the green waste and i've been told it's it's going to be sold I is Sanford Depot going to be sold? And you're buying new depots. Can you? We're losing you, Anne. <sighs> Shall I? I'm going to refer the comments on the green waste to yeah, Mike know, Solomon and the comments me, on the strawberry line, I think, also uh, to uh, Mike Solomon, me, Anne, for now? comment. Not can now. now. Because I just. I've met with Mike Solomon, and he's great. But I, I just want to know and ask Councillor Cartman, have you? It's like it's like, like a, for those sufficiently old, remember Norman you, Collier. I, I know they're all laughing around. Can you hear me? I mean, this is just I can't a hear you. Thing with this. Um... God. Right. Then I suggest you answer where you can. Right, so I've referred the comments you made, Anne, to the relevant executive members to consideration. Um, and I'm now going to go to Councillor Nigel Ashton, who's next on the list. I'll try to be a little bit clearer, Chairman. Um, I, 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 from what I could see... Can you budget... hear me now? Can you hear me now? <laughs> she does that on the phone as well. Could you like continue, Can you hear Chairman? me now? We're, re we're really struggling. I'm going, to, I'm going to go to Nigel now, Anne, because I can't really hear you. 
Um, just as a general question on the budget, I, I guess it's still a moving feast because there aren't reserves and things like that in there. And, and uh, as in previous years, it sort of uh, it changes right up to the last moment. So I, I get that. Um, but I do have just one or two specific concerns. Um, the, the budget on home to school transport, which has been a real problem, in, especially in the, the rural, some of the rural areas, uh, for many years, three or, three or four years certainly, because of the shortage of drivers and things like that, which goes back some time. Um, but given that more parents are probably returning to, to workplaces, even if it's just part of the week, children hopefully now back to full-time education, uh, fuel costs still rising and the, the cost of finding qualified and suitable drivers is just r rising exponentially. Uh, I, am ex I am really concerned on specific issues as well that the proposed budget is less than the actual expenditure during the present year when there would have been children not going to school, um, parents uh, uh, at home for, for longer. Um, the increased costs and increased demand for such an important services for our children, including just their safety. Um, can you assure me that you've got enough contingency to cover this known risk? Like, as I say, I can't see the contingencies, either departmental or, or overall. Uh, can you can assure me that there is enough um, to, to cover this known risk, which is, is not so much a risk as a near certainty. There are already failures in the service before these budget cuts. And, and secondly, on, on children's services, trying not to look at it, Sh Sheila at the moment, um, probably our most sensitive demand-led service, uh, and in, in real terms, there's a cut in there over the years. Um, and, and whilst I'm told that there, are, there is a reduction in, I think, the number of looked after children, which is excellent news from one point of view, as long as they're still being reported, it was always a, a problem in the past. Um, but that can, it, it, it can, whatever the reason is, that can change at any time and it doesn't really leave any room for argument. It's, a, it's clearly a demand-led service that has to be met. Um, so again, is there enough in the contingency for that element as well? Um, and will we at some stage be informed of what all the reserves that we have got held, whether it's department or, or, or across the council? Because I've always found that under budgeting is just as dangerous as over budgeting because you start to make cuts that don't really need to be made in some vital services. Thank you, Chairman. Shall I? Thank you, thank you, Councillor Ashton. I think you're right in terms of the home to school transport. It's a it's a notoriously difficult area to predict, isn't it? And I know we've put extra money in, but you're right in terms of the the drivers of the cost make it even more risky and, and the variation in terms of what we could see coming out due to the driver shortage. I think about an extra half a million has gone in is my recollection. It, it may well be that's not enough. I think at this point we can't tell. It is a moving feast. So we'll come, come back to that. So I, I do agree so with you. Tim. You, you have put more in, but it's less than we're already spending. I, would, I, I couldn't tell you off the back just then, but I'd have to have a look. I'm happy to come back to you on that. And if that's the case, if we're putting less in than what the... I don't know what the current run rate is. I know it's on the way up, I think would be my short answer, and we're quite aware of that, and that's being managed as a risk into next year's budget, which I think brings me on to my next point that you said about reserves, and you're absolutely right. If, if of course, we under-budget in some areas, we'd hope to over-budget in others, and I think your experience would be that sometimes that's the case and sometimes not, and sometimes that means you then have to, to use your reserves. I think in terms of the, and Amy will come in, I'm sure will correct me here, the, the, the value of the financial risk reserve or is that the general fund reserve is holding steady that's not being reduced and other reserves have quite markedly increased over last year now that's partly due to um, government funding patterns that have come in but it does mean we've got a, a bit more flexibility to meet those pressures as they come through although I'm quite happy to give you the more detail to reassure you on that if that would be helpful I think that lays into the the, the children's placements cost as well and I, I have the same concern as you and I had a, quite a, a call with with Sheila and Catherine from the finance department looking at those numbers. And I think when, when in 2019, we were about at 245 children, I think, in placement, and now we're under 200, so quite, quite, a, quite a fall. I think the, the reassurance in terms of um, those numbers not escalating is we've got the step-down program in place, which has been quite successful, but also the anticipated uptick in numbers that we were expecting as we came out of COVID is not materialising, although saying that it does present a risk and you know even one placement can be quite expensive. 
I, again, I'd have to confirm, but I think I'm pretty sure that the numbers we're budgeting for are more than the ones we've currently got in placements and in care. So we are expecting it to increase. Again, coming back to your point of whether that will be prudent enough, I was assured it was. I think hindsight will tell us the answer of whether it, it was or not, which comes back full circle to your point on reserves and contingencies, doesn't it? So I think that's it. Um, I think I've, I think they were your points, and perhaps I'd ask Amy to make a comment on reserves, if that's okay. Amy. I think just for clarity, on well, the home school transport, of course, last year we were doing a lot of extra transport because of social distancing of pupils on the on the buses, and we had to introduce some coaches where people were going on trains previously. So I'm not quite sure. I'm not speaking as, as an expert, no, so please don't think I am. But we did have a lot of pressures for additional services for the for the for the uh, COVID distancing. Yeah, yeah. I, I get that, but. Um there were also times when people weren't going to school, so it wasn't needed, so there was some reduction. I don't think there were very many cases where the services didn't actually run, though, Nigel. I think they were, they were running, even with less people on. Amy, you want to come in? Thank you. Um, and I'm also not sure whether we were contractually obliged to pay for some of those services, but we can, yes, Gemma's confirming that's correct. So uh, in terms of any potential savings opportunities from schools being closed, I don't think those materialised. Um, but thank you. Just in terms of overall budget risk, I thought it would be helpful, obviously, uh, to confirm the home to schools transport. You are correct, um, Councillor Ashton, in that at the moment we are... Sorry, I'll try and speak a bit more clearly. Um, at the moment, we are... Um, our run rate in 21-22 is exceeding the amount which has been put into the budget um, for 22-23. Um, however, the service are doing a detailed deep dive into home to school transport and see what controls, mitigations and so, um, services can be put in there in the future to support that. And just like, um, you know, the looked after children budgets as well, we do have to draw a, land in, uh, a line in the sand at, uh, in terms of our financial planning um, for those growth and reduction figures. Um, so, yes, we do have some um, contingency still within the looked after children's budget and overall we have contingency within the revenue budget for 22-23 and reserves which are there to manage those financial risks if they were to materialise. Um, so for example this year we did put considerable growth into adult social care uh, which is an area that we've seen a significant overspend in 21-22. Um, so whilst we've put addition, additional budgets in obviously they've been reduced in other areas. Um, but I'm confident we can manage those risks within the year. Thank you. Thank you. The next person I've got is Bridget Petty. Thank you. I think I, I just wanted to raise a few points. Um, no one, not us in this room and, and their residents will be happy to be paying more tax, but I think that they will be reassured by the detail um, that has been presented in these reports. And I think, for me, it still reminds us that we need to push government to address the, the short-term nature of their funding that they offer to local councils. Because each year it, it becomes, pro it is problematic time and again that a council finds it difficult to, to manage any long-term planning in, in the way that finances are provided from, local, from central government. In the mid-term financial plan, I was delighted to see the line which read, there are numerous climate-related implications within the revenue budget, although these are integrated into the business-as-usual ways in which services are being considered and delivered, rather than being seen as separate components of the budget itself. This is absolutely the way that... Is it still working? Sorry. This is absolutely the way that we should be doing this, with the climate emergency being at the forefront of everyone in North Somerset Council's minds. We must make sure that we are reflecting this in our decision-making processes and our communications. So I'm really pleased with that report um, and that uh, information in that part of the document. With regards to the capital strategy, uh, I really support the work that um, Councillor Cartman has been talking about, his reference to Open Fair Agreena, and the way Councillor Bell um, pointed out that as an executive from different parties, we have been discussing the budget, we have been discussing priorities, and together we've been finding compromise. And supporting future generations and supporting children is something that the Green Group, uh, and me as a representative of the Green Group, really supported. I'm also glad that the tackling the climate emergency has a significant budget line in the capital strategy. 
However, we do need to make sure that the planning and decision-making processes are tightened and funding increased for all projects to ensure that all of our capital projects are fit for the future and do not do more harm. The first question should always be, can this be a zero carbon project and contribute to our response to the climate emergency and the nature emergency? And if the answer is no, we shouldn't do that project. We cannot remove our environmental objectives because of cost. Thank you. Thank you. I've got uh, Catherine Gibbons. Thank you. Um, I must join the fan club and uh, thank <laughs> Councillor Cartman for this. And also, as others have alluded, thank my executive colleagues that we have got children and young people front and foremost in, as our priority um, in this budget. And as a council, I have to say, it's all the more important as we come out of COVID, you know, when we think about um, the effects that have been really harsh on young people. You look at the Marmot Review, the update, um, where a key recommendation is that if we're going to build for the future, we have to prioritize children and young people. Because although they may not have been so much at risk from the effects of the disease as older adults, they have been really disproportionately affected um, and inequitably affected by the effects of the lockdowns and all the activities that we've had to force upon our residents throughout COVID. And we're seeing the most rapid increases in uh, poor mental health, in anxiety and in unemployment for young people that we already had problems with pre-pandemic. So I am delighted that we are taking this uh, as a really important tenet for our council. And like the leader alluded to, the fact that we are investing in play areas is incredibly important. We've also kept up our investment into our children's centers and we are developing some of them into family hubs so we'll be able to offer services to families and older children. I mean, we've also built back so much capacity within children's services and the education liaison department so we're going to be able as a council to work more closely with our schools, to be engaging with them and hopefully hearing the voices of young people as I alluded to before. So I'd just like to thank everybody for, for that aspect of what we have achieved or we hope to achieve. Thank you. The last person I had to speak was Steve Bridger. Any, anybody else I've missed? Oh, yeah, Steve Bridger then Ros, okay. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, a couple of brief, very brief comments. Um, Partly to respond to Councillor Cato, Councillor Cato's comments at the, at the top of the item, uh, with my cap capital delivery hat on, um, the, the documents do refer to a capital strategy action plan. So I think we're, we're do, continuing to do lots of work to strengthen our capital governance, and uh, I very much welcome the engagement and challenge of, of, of scrutiny in that area, and, and Bridges' challenge around climate emergency too, as you just made. Um, yeah, and also the, um, the creation of the £1.5 million capital and infrastructure feasibility fund. And obviously, a key benefit, beneficiary of that will be, hopefully, the Strawberry Line extension to Clevedon, which, to my mind, is, is the holy grail of our active travel ambition. Um, we want to extend the Strawberry Line to Clevedon. Um, we've had, uh, I have fre frequent meetings about that. Lots of work's taking place. Uh, Councillor Jeff Richardson lead, leads, leads that, uh, our stakeholder group along with uh, the input of Councillor um, Richard Westwood, and officers and, and other stakeholders. So hopefully we can, in this next financial, financial year, we can properly resource some feasibility work about, around that uh, project with, a, with the aim of, of delivering on those uh, improvements in 24-25. That would be, I think, absolutely huge for um, residents of Yatton, Cleveland and the surrounding area. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Ros? Thank you. First time in here for 23 months. Feels a little strange. I'm wearing the yellow daffodil, so as you know as I am. Mine's a request, uh, please, for a reconsideration. So we've got the customer access strategy that is being looked at, um, etc., and making sure that we're right for our residents. We don't have the gateway access for um, town hall 
for customers or for Castle Wood at the moment. I understand in 2021 MTFP it was taken out, um, but I stupidly assumed, you should never assume, that that wasn't permanent. I assumed that was because of COVID restrictions. I hadn't realized that it was going to be looked at as permanent. A lot of our residents don't have internet. They're not internet savvy. A lot of them, as we've seen today and many times over the last months, we might have internet at home, but the signal's so awful that it drops out. A lot of people in social housing don't have landlines. They have mobile phones which are expensive to run. So making phone calls in to try and get an appointment to see somebody when they could just come into the town hall or Castlewood whilst it's there um, makes it difficult. Not all libraries are accessible or even there. So I'm asking that um, you reconsider that budget line um, for customer access at the, the town hall and Castlewood whilst it's there, please, because I think it is most important for our residents. I've got many, many residents now who are delighted they've got a bus service going, but they haven't got anywhere to go because they can't come to the town hall to ask anything because they want to come down and talk about housing benefit or blue badges. They don't realize they've got to make a phone call to come and talk about it. You know, they're not knowing that information. So that's my plea. Thank you. In the budget line. Hey. I was going to ask, um, we're going to go start going through the items now, Ash, but do you want to answer that specifically? Um, yeah, if I'd like to make a few comments to some of the other people as well, I'll be, I'll be brief though. Um, just Councillor Harley, um, there was maintenance on the strawberry line last year, but I appreciate your concern and we will have a look at that. I think with green waste, I think it's a case of officers advise and councillors decide, and that session was about um, officers' proposals. We have decided not to increase the green waste charge and Councillor Solomon will come back in terms of the rebate that will be going out to residents. Um, I've already answered Councillor Ashton. Councillor Petty, I agree with the need to embed green decision-making. Um, Councillor Gibbons, yeah, absolutely agree, and there's this scope in there for the Carlton Centre as well, refurbishment to be done. And I think you're pleased that the Mockingbird project that we funded as a one-off last year has been very successful and has now been made permanent to help support residents. Um, Councillor Bridger, yes, the £1.5 million feasibility fund, which I didn't mention, which is actually, uh, you know, helps us deliver more capital projects quicker, much welcomed. And Councillor Willis, said, it is a concern, and I struggle with this, I think, if I address it directly, because it's a balance between the, the cost of providing those services, which we know is more, but also the equalities implications of making sure that those who can't access can have access and I'll, I'll be honest we haven't yet got to the bottom of that which is why we've got a new strategy coming forward and in that strategy we are definitely open to any considerations on that I, I think in terms of the current provision I would probably have to ask someone else in terms of where we are with the current operations of both the town hall and Castlewood in terms of face-to-face -face. I believe people can come in for a telephone appointment but that's I think that's the current position is that it? So I think we're going to have to access that as part of the, the customer access strategy, which I think is coming in about March, April time to council, I believe. And I think that I'm keen that there's member engagement on that in advance, because I'm aware it's quite a concern to many members. Thank you, Leader. Thank you. So I don't see any other requests to speak. So we're just going to go to item number 14 on the, on the agenda, which is the um, fees and charges. There's a recommendation to approve to changes to fees and charges as, as detailed in section three. Um, do I have a proposal for that? Councillor Cartman, a seconder. Councillor Canniford, all those in favour? That's unanimous and against, thank you. I now move on to um, the Treasury Management. Forgive me just a few minutes while I flick across on my, which is on page 545. There are th um, three recommendations the Treasury Management Strategy, the Prudential Indicators, and the Minimum Revenue Provision Statements as detailed on page 545 of our papers. Do I see Councillor Carman proposing? Do I see a seconder? I see Councillor Solomon. All those in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you, colleagues. I now move to page 577. They're not shown in the manual dexterity. Perhaps some of you should. in which there is um, four different recommendations. Are we happy to take those on block? Do 
Do I get Councillor Cartman to support, to propose? And Councillor Petty is seconding. All those in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you, colleagues. And then the final item, which is the perhaps most meaty, is item 17, which is on page 609. <coughs> of which there are six recommendations. I was just checking my Latin counting. Are we happy to take them on block? Do I get a proposal from Councillor Cartman? Do I see a seconder? Councillor Canniford? All those in favour? Thank you, colleagues. Any against? No, that's a unanimous. Thank you, colleagues. That's that then. So we'll now move on to the next item, which will be item 11, the Highway Maintenance Contract Extension which I think there's a doubt on who's... Is that Councillor Canniford? Are you leading that one? Was it Councillor Solomon? Uh, actually, it, it is assigned to you, Mark. And I, I had, so um, I assumed you were doing it, even though it possibly is mine. But it is assigned to you, so uh, <laughs> it's not on anymore. Well, I saw it, so... Um, I must apologise. I, I saw it as being signed to Councillor Canniford, so uh, I haven't done any prepare, preparation on it. Well if, well, if you can chat away, I can get page to page 451 on my sheet, so just carry on for a few seconds. Well, I, I'm happy to move the recommendations. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Is anybody happy to second it? Councillor Solomon? Okay, so all those in favour? Any against? Well, sorry, I didn't ask people for comments. I, just, I do apologise. Are there any questions or comments? In my enthusiasm. No? Okay, thank you very much. We'll now move on to item number seven, sorry, item number 12, which is the recommissioning of the flexible framework of independent fostering providers. I assume that would be Councillor Gibbons. I think I might get that one right. That's what it says. Thank goodness. <laughs> yes. Well, if Councillor Solomon wants to do it, I'm more than happy. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, I think uh, you'll remember that uh, Council agreed uh, to commission a foster care framework um, at the last Council meeting, and this paper is to ask colleagues to approve the award of the contract as outlined in the previously agreed commissioning plan, and to approve acceptance of the providers that have been that have successfully applied to the flex flexible framework, and to delegate the approval of future additions to the flexible framework during the contract term to the Director of Children's Services. Um, I won't go on too much because this is thankfully fairly brief paper and I'm sure that you've all read it and, and understand what we're dealing with here. Um, basically there were 29 providers in the current framework looking after a total of 92 children and young people placed with foster families. Um, and the intention with the new flexible framework is for the contract for 48 months from the 1st of April 2022 with an optional 24-month extension. North Somerset Council is part of the South West uh, Sub-Regional Commissioning Group, as we had heard when we discussed this at full council. And uh, obviously there's a determination within the council that our most vulnerable children and young people get really good family-based care within North Somerset. We do our best to recruit as many in-house foster carers as we can. And if you look at the figures on, uh, in section five, you will see how our numbers of IFA, that's independent fostering agency placements, have come down. However, we still need these placements, and this framework is going to allow us to offer some really good care and placements to a number of young people. It's been allocated in, a number, in three main lots. That's standard, solo, and specialist placement, which is outlined in the paper, and I won't read through. The market engagement exercise that was held in the autumn was hosted by all four authorities in the framework and attended by 35 providers. 31 of these providers applied for the flexible framework and they applied submitting tenders for all three categories of placement. So, sorry. 
Um, I'll go, I won't go into the depths of the financial implications. I'm happy to answer questions at the end of this, and all the data is laid out in the paper. What I would say to people is that all the successful applications, the providers have demonstrated elements of social value that will benefit specific geographical areas of the commissioning local authorities and their local communities. And that I think members can feel confident that the methods that we have for measuring the effectiveness of these providers are robust and key performance indicators and a standard set of performance indicators concerning the overall service are in place. So we'll measure the children and young people's outcomes against those identified in their individual placement agreement and also the stability of the placements. The most important thing is that we should be offering the best possible chance for these young people. The successful providers, Bridget, I'm, this is for you, <laughs> will also be required to adhere to environmentally friendly practices wherever possible. And North Somerset Council officers will continue to use video and teleconferencing apps to meet with other authority colleagues and providers. And where in-person attendance is required, we'll maximize the use of public transport or other sources of sustainable transport. So here we are definitely embedding environmental concerns into this. Um, so I'm hoping for the approval of this. And I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, as thank I'm you. Sure so, the are you happy is. to make to propose the recommendations? Yes, I would like to propose the two recommendations at the start of the paper. Lovely. Is there a seconder, Councillor Petty? Uh, first of all, um, to Sheila Smith, is there anything you need to add? No, thank you. Any comments, questions, queries? I can't see anybody in the virtual world with any hands up. Anybody in the in the real world? Okay, we'll go straight to the vote then. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. So all those in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you, colleagues. We now move on to um, the next item, which is item 13, which is on the joint statutory public bus enhancement partnership. I mean, this is an ambitious plan to relaunch bus travel post-pandemic and the Bus Back Better document that came out from government last year set out some pretty ambitious um, targets to do so. We've, we've embraced that in combination with the West of England Combined Authority to produce our enhanced partnership and our bus service improvement plan. That's been issued and you can see on item three of the paper the very ambitious objectives we are setting with this. But sadly, as I'm sure lots of you are aware, there have been some delays in terms of this. So I think the substantive um, recommendations are as per the paper. But I, Colin Meadis has very kindly given me a form of words for an update because I was very nervous about saying something that wasn't absolutely up to date. So th this, is, this is what Colin said to me, and I repeat, repeat out for everybody's benefit. So thank you, Colin. This report was prepared when we were expecting to complete the implementation of the enhanced partnership to be completed by the end of March. However, we received a letter from the Department for Transport in the middle of January, which effectively puts the process on pause. The Department for Transport suggested they would give us more information by the end of February, including more details on financial matters. What they have said is that local transport authorities now need to submit a draft EP, enhanced partnership, by the end of April, with the, with the final EP to be completed at some future date for which we are yet to be notified. Given we have completed the operator objections period on the draft EP, which is attached in the draft of the report, it may mean that we can relatively easily complete the EP once we understand the new timetable. However, it may be the Department for Transport impose new requirements related to the funding, which would require the EP to be substantially revised, in which case it will be brought back to a future executive meeting. So I'm sure that's as clear as mud, but I thought it was important to say that we are in a very fluid situation. And in terms of the recommendations, item three would cover that eventuality. So um, I was going to propose the three recommendations. Do I see a seconder? Mike Bell, thank you. Any questions, colleagues? Or from the... Roz. Could I ask under this about the... The Western Supermare lateness of the hub opening. I'm calling it the hub. 
Can I ask under this? Leader? If you'd like to. Thank you. So, obviously, it's been a big project and it's yes. been a long time doing. Um, if it's possible, could I just ask whether the um, changes that weren't suitable, that aren't right, um, as in bus stop and markings, etc., is that down to contractors or is it down to planning? Uh, planning wrong or planning not going in correctly and also have there been penalties um, in that contract well, I think for lateness, is that possible? Or I, I can't answer those questions at the moment because I spent most of yesterday and the day before trying to prioritise how we can get the thing working for the, for the public. I, mean, I would say first of all the bus services have continued and the team have been out there notifying members of the public about where they need to go for the bus stops and my priority has been and there will be exactly what you've asked for brought forward in due course but the priority has not been to be navel gazing but actually to get the thing up uh, up and running and i'm hoping from what i heard yesterday that the, the 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 majority of the issues can be reasonably easily resolved i guess the question that i have asked on behalf of north somerset residents bus passengers in particular is around safety because that was raised within the statement you would have seen last week so I very much ask that we have a safe, an independent safety audit completed to sign off what has been suggested, which are relatively minor amendments to where we are, um, just to make sure that when it does go live, it is safe, because I think that is the absolute priority to me, to have something that, 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 that is workable and actually make sure that bus passengers and indeed the wider public can en enter and use those services in a safe way. Does that answer your question. I appreciate we're going to have to come back in due course and absolutely answer the questions, but I was very keen not to delay officers doing that when the public actually need to use the services. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Leader. I, I wasn't meant as a political No, no not at all. No, I, 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 was, I was frustrated as yeah. everybody uh, else is by this. Yeah, I have you know, a number of residents mm. who've been asking me, etc., as well as knowing for myself. So, yeah, in time, if we can have that back. And, yeah, I fully understand. We just had a meeting at lunchtime um, with Carl Nicholson and others about mm. the services. So, please, to get it open as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Ros. Um, yeah, it's desperately frustrating. I'm sure colleagues in Western Supermare find it even more frustrating than I have a distance away. So, um, Bridget? Um, we had a positive briefing from Colin Meadis last week around um, progress on the situation with uh, buses locally and nationally. Um, and I think it's helpful to, you know, I think it's helpful to councillors to be more informed and then for us to help residents understand. And still I feel like my summary is it's really complicated, it's not appropriately funded and it, it hasn't been appropriately funded for, for a long time. I did take away Colin Medes' message of use it or lose it, and so I came to the meeting by bus today, um, but I had used it um, last week as well, heading into Bristol um, when the ticket fares have, have changed. So the app has improved, there are more ticket options, um, and, and I value that, and, but being aware of how many passengers they've lost through this period of COVID, um, is important and it's important to recognize that we still have people in our communities who are not comfortable and ready to return to public transport and yet we need and we deserve a quality service that is reliable and that is affordable um, and so I know it's it feels and it is a chicken and egg situation but the, the more we can and the more we can use it but the more we can also tell those, you know, gov government and others, that it is valued by our communities. Um, I am receiving emails from residents asking for, for better service. Um, then I think that's worth sharing, and that's part of our role as as elected councillors, but also as a community who is, is responding to the climate emergency. Thanks. Yeah, I would agree. If we don't, if we don't demonstrate use of the services, even the circ in the circumstances you described, then ultimately it isn't proving a demand. Mike Bell. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I just wanted to make a point that I have made, I know, to officers and uh, you, Councillor Davis, before, but I think it's just worth re-emphasising it in, in talking about the um, enhanced partnership arrangements, and, and that is that I think it's really important that as part of the enhanced partnership, we emphasise to uh, bus operators the importance of good communication and consultation with communities. We've had some changes obviously uh, in North Somerset recently in Western Supermare and Portishead amongst others which have had 
negative impact in terms of service provision and, and uh, of course we all understand the challenges and complexities around that for the bus operators but I would really like to see the enhanced partnership really specifically mentioning the importance of consultation and engagement not just with the transport authorities uh, through the local councils but, um, but also with town and parish councils and with local members as well because we just need to be better at communicating what's happening uh, giving a voice to local communities and making sure that the nuances um, of local service changes are properly picked up um, by the operators uh, before they're implemented. So I just wanted to just echo that. I'm very supportive of our overall approach, but anything that officers and you as, as portfolio holder can do to, to press that point with the wider partners would be really welcome. Thank you. Um, unless there are any other questions, I was, Colin's online. Did you think you wanted to add to that, Colin? Um, only just to pick up that last point that Councillor Bell raised, I was just looking at the um, appendix uh, and uh, in section 3.21, there's a whole section in the enhanced partnership uh, detailing how um, uh, bus operators should improve their uh, engagement when they do change services. So that is something that the enhanced partnership um, is trying to pick up pick up so just wanted to confirm that thank you thanks Colin thanks for coming on the call and thanks for the statement as well so I think we'll go for the vote do we have any in favor that's unanimous thank you colleagues um, I'm now going to propose an adjournment For which will become very clear in a moment. If, if members of the where, we, where do you want to meet, Joe? Up, upstairs? Yeah. yeah, could we go up to the executive room? Sorry, colleagues, but something has just come to my attention which I need to consult with my executive about. We'll be back as quick as we can. Sorry.
Right, apologies, colleagues, for the adjournment. Um, are we back on, Mike? Okay, get my colleagues' chance to sit down. Okay, I'm going to now go on to item 18 of the agenda, which is the oral reports of executive councillors. I'm going to lead on this. I'm Um, we, we've just been informed in the last few minutes that the airport appeal has been allowed. Um, and I have prepared a statement which I'm going to read out. So everybody's aware of our situation. North Somerset Council leader Don Davis has expressed his extreme disappointment at the inspector's decision. Having heard all the evidence and listened to both professional advice and the views of local residents, our planning committee voted to refuse the application to expand the airport's capacity beyond an as yet unreached 10 million passengers a year, being barely 8 million pre-pandemic. The refusal was based on sound planning grounds and the firm belief that the detrimental effect of the expansion of the airport on this area and the wider impact on the environment outweighed the narrower benefits of airport expansion which sit almost entirely in the commercial interests of the owners of foreign pension fund. At the inquiry, our team of specialist consultants led by a senior QC mounted a robust defense of the council's position is extremely dis disappointing. The inspectors have overturned our decision and given the go ahead for Bristol airport to grow even further with all the associated noise, environmental and health impacts that entails. This simply flies in the face of local democracy and disregards the views of the local communities who fought equally hard to resist the expansion. It completely undermines our visions for a greener North Somerset, our determination to tackle the climate emergency and the target we have set for the area to be carbon neutral by 2030. We face a climate emergency and to countenance yet more leisure flights that pre predominate from this airport is completely unacceptable from one of the main sources of greenhouse gas emissions. The airport's important role in the region's economy would have continued without expanding beyond its current 10 million passengers a year limit. We are studying the inspector's decision to see if there are any grounds for challenge and we're working hard regardless to hold the airport to account, deliver their promises on reducing the carbon impact of the airport operation, especially around non-car travel to the airport and the greenwashing promises of the airline industry to, to decarbonize, which in reality will not happen in this decade. Thank you. Okay, do any of my colleagues have any addresses to make? Um, I'll go around the table as it were. Catherine? I'm sorry, did you mean on this announcement? No, in more general terms. Oh, in more general. Um, I only had one very brief announcement. I've alluded to it in other comments I've made, but just to tell colleagues that we had the first meeting of the North Somerset Youth Parliament, is what they voted to call themselves, and uh, we look forward to having a vibrant forum with which to engage young people on some of our strategies and decisions and indeed our council processes because they've expressed an interest in learning more about participation in local politics and how they can influence us. So thank that's you. all. And I'd like to thank our youth champions and Councillor Nicola Holland for working so hard to bring this to Okay, um, Mike, Mike Solomon? No, nothing. Okay, uh, Bridget? Ash? Mark? Yes, Chairman, just quickly and very briefly, um, anyone uh, tuned in watching us today, the Omicron, Omicron uh, Hospitality and Leisure Grants are open for applications now, and I ask businesses who have been affected by this to, to make those applications. Thank you. I urge colleagues to spread the news around their local communities as well to make sure as many businesses here as possible. Uh, Mike Bell? No, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Steve Bridger? Okay, thank you. We'll now move on to... Item 10, which is the waste strategy, Mike Solomon. Thank you, Don. Um, uh, before I go into that, I'd just like to very quickly answer Anna Harley's question of earlier about the uh, 
the garden waste compensation. Uh, we said all along that we would be waiting until a bit later so we knew the extent of the miscollections before we worked to scheme out. We're now at that situation and we, we have some figures that have been worked out that will then um, be uh, looked at by the executive and so it will be coming forward quite quickly uh, with uh, the compensation scheme. So uh, to move on, I'd like to recommend um, the waste strategy to the executive. Um, it's really all about working with residents, um, local town and parish councillors and businesses to improve the way and change the way we're, uh, we're running our waste service. What we want to see is a big reduction in residual waste, and that's the waste that isn't recycled. Um, so at the moment, we're, we're number seven on the, the table throughout the, uh, the UK for, for recycling, so we're well up there. Um, but we'd like to, by um, 2030, uh, increase by around 15% uh, the, the amount of stuff we put to recycling. And if you ever look at the figures uh, now that have been increasing for the, the money we're seeing back from our recycling, they're going up. Um, they do fluctuate, but at the moment they're quite high. And we're seeing really, really sound money back for recycling. So the more we recycle, the better it's going to be. And it's all about uh, education, edu educating people. If you look at people's um, black sacks, you can see approximately 45% of what's in that sack could be going to recycling, and that's what we want to see. Again, we want to see um, food recycling increasing. There's around 27% of the, the waste that's left in, in black sacks of food recycling. And if we can get that food recycling, you know, uh, food, sorry, food, food waste, if we can get that to recycling, then again, it can be used um, you know, every, I believe every ton of, of, of food waste that we, we put through the plant um, reduces half a ton of, um, you know, of, of, uh, of a, um, emissions, gas emissions. So, so that's really important. So uh, we want to improve all the uh, recycling facilities. We want to make our streets cleaner. We want to come down heavily on fly tipping. Uh, and reuse is really important as well. We're looking at all the different ways that we can set up centers throughout the district that um, people can bring stuff along, stuff that's been dropped at our amenities can go and be repaired and used again. So it's a really important strategy that we look at uh, reuse. I, I had an article sent to me recently um, that a gentleman had had his toaster for 71 years. He'd repaired it every, every four or five years. He'd had to have it repaired, but he'd had it for 71 years. So it's important that we look at reuse, etc. cetera. Um, and so I would uh, like to recommend that uh, we, uh, we pass this, uh, this strategy, please. I've been notified of an amendment by Councillor Bell. Uh, thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, I'd just like to move an amendment to the recommendations uh, in the report. Um, and these amendments have been circulated to uh, executive colleagues. But that is to replace um, recommendations on one and two with new amended wording um, to read that the executive agrees to amend the draft waste strategy in accordance with revised actions two and three set out in this report. Uh, but declines to update the draft strategy in ways proposed in revised action one at this time. Uh, and then two, that the executive agrees to adopt the North Somerset waste strategy as amended by these recommendations with any further minor amendments for clarity prior to publication being approved by the executive member in consultation with the director of place. Um, and I'll look for a seconder to that amendment. Okay, so, excuse me. Thank you. Um, and, and just by way of, of rationale, um, we've got an excellent uh, waste strategy that's gone through a comprehensive um, program of engagement with um, policy and scrutiny panels, with elected members, with community stakeholders, with officers, uh, and with the wider uh, residents of North Somerset. Uh, it sets out really strong and clear ambitions for the future to continue to build upon the excellent uh, record that we have in providing um, waste and recycling services and in particular the 
uh, UK leading performance uh, of our residents in terms of the proportion of their waste uh, that is recycled. However, um, we do recognize that this is a moment where we've had significant changes in our uh, waste and recycling service over the last couple of years. We've brought it in-house uh, recently. We've obviously delivered the new garden waste service and there will be further changes as proposed as part of this waste strategy. So now is not the time for further consideration uh, of changes to frequencies or um, uh, collection regimes. So that's the reason for the amendment. Uh, it's not to, to set uh, a path for, for the long term, but it is, is to very much recognize that we've made a lot of changes in, in recent times, um, and now is not the right time to progress further changes around uh, a frequency of collections. So I hope um, colleagues will support that amendment. Okay, so we have the amendment. Do we want to vote on the amendment we've been proposed and seconded? All those in favor of the amendment? Are there any against? Okay, well, that's carried. Thank you. So we'll now debate the amended um, proposition. Do we have any questions? I can see Karen's got her hand up. Karen, Karen Haverson? Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, in view of the shattering news we've just heard about the airport, which would have been a really big step for North Somerset, I think we'll have to concentrate on the little steps we can take, and this is... I'm afraid uh, this is one of the occasions where I would disagree within our, our alliance with the, with the amendment because I think we need to take every little step we can in, in reducing our carbon footprint. And I personally, I can speak from personal experience with the three weekly collection because I happen to live on the boundary with Somerset and my waste is actually collected by Somerset. Somerset have just taken this step and taken it very successfully. They've in introduced it in stages, and I understand that they had the first pilot studies about six years ago, so it's a really long-term process, and as I understand from the initial proposal, it would have been just a pilot study we're proposing, not the introduction of the whole scheme. So I, I would still really like to, to see that pilot study go ahead. I would also like us to learn from our neighbors because Somerset is not the only council who's introduced this. Uh, I've looked, uh, looked on the internet and I know Hereford, for example, have done across the, uh, the waters. Conway have introduced it. And there are always detailed issues with people with nappies or other incontinence <laughs> problems or or uh, other, other I flat issues, but all these councils have found solutions to that. So it's not insurmountable. And I, I just think this would be showing that we take our climate emergency declaration seriously. I know it's a small step, and I know it's another big ask, but I'm asking for it, because I think we need to show that we act where we can, and where central government puts a kibosh on our ambitions, then we can only do the small steps. Um, so, yeah, please, please consult with Somerset especially. They're no different. I'm sure Taunton is no different from Western Supermare with issues like flats or nappies or anything like that. They've, I've talked to somebody this afternoon about it, and they've got plans in place for the nappies. I, one way around it is Conway are putting, um, putting special caddies out for people with nappies. Somerset are planning to put stickers on their bins to allow people who apply for it to have extra sacks to dispose of their nappies. So there are ways around it that make it easy, but I think we just need to try and take those little, little steps we can while we can because time is running out, as we all know. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. I think uh, so, um, I know the comments you're making. I guess the, the, the thing that I would really like us to do as well is to examine people who live in flats and smaller houses who don't get the current full service. And I guess probably in terms of a priority, we also need to look at that as well to, min you know, to minimize that in, within, within flats because it is very difficult. So I do, but I do appreciate your comments. So thank you. Um, I've got John Cato next. Uh, thank you, Chair. So, and Leader, I'd just like to support Councillor Haverson's viewpoint on this and um, ask that it be you know, thought through. Thank you. Okay, thank you, John. Um, Steve Bridger. Thank you, Chair. 
Um, just like to agree with your comments you just made about, about flats, actually. I'd just like to remind people that we're, what we're talking about here is a recycling and waste strategy for the next 10 years. Um, there are some really important measures in that document. I don't think we can lift, I don't think you can lift out any of those measures to, to view those in isolation. I think we're talking about a package here and clearly um, the, what we do introduce will be sort of commensurate with how recycling rates increase. So you know, if people recycle more, they won't fill their bins and we would need to react to that. So um, I support the strategy. Thank you. Uh, Bridget Petty. Thank you. Um, I really welcome the amount of work that has taken place from all the officers who have been involved in this. And I'm aware that the consultation took place last year and I welcome all those who have, have contributed it and taken time to do that. I felt it was important uh, as a Green Party councillor um, not to support that amendment because um, I feel like it is watering down the action that we can take on our doorstep. And as we've seen in this meeting, we've taken action before in saying no to an airport expansion, but the airport came back to appeal that. I think we need to see when we have the role to play where we are the leaders and where we are the community leaders and where it is national government, we must push hard on that. So it's fair to say that in North Somerset greenhouse gas emissions perspective, a three-week collect collection won't make a big difference. However, the potential behavioural changes which can come from reduced collections can make a bigger difference. We as a society need to dramatically reduce our consumption, and this is a step towards doing it. I hope that there will still be some thought about how we push to continue to increase the strong recycling rate we have. And as others have said, some of those living in flats at the moment don't have access to food waste recycling. We must, be all, we must also be able to see the bigger picture when it comes to decisions on climate and sustainability issues. Looking at each decision individually, there will always be a reason not to do things. It'd be that cost, popularity, significance of impact. But nationally and locally, we need to change almost everything to meet our net zero targets, our energy system, our transport system, our economic models. We cannot water down our policies simply because human nature is to resist change. Change can be difficult, but the rewards can be great. And right now, we know that if we don't change, the risks to our communities on our doorstep are significant. And that is the reason that I come here today to keep pushing for change and keep encouraging us to challenge ourselves beyond our comfort zones. And I know it's not comfortable and I know we won't, I won't win the vote every time, but it's still the right thing to do. And, and I'm proud to be here as a Green Party councillor saying that. Thank you. Okay, Mike Solomon. Yes, just uh, coming back. Um, it's not always a success story I mean, uh, with councillors trialling in the three weeks. Um, I've been reading about councils that, that have reversed the decisions after doing a trial. So it, it's not always successful. But I, I think this is very much about um, educating people. And if we can educate people um, and, and just drum home how much they will save, um, uh, save us uh, as a community by, by recycling, how much by um, us introducing a collection of food waste uh, at flat, we can, we can then uh, put food waste uh, you know, it, it back into the recycling route, then those sorts of measures that we really need to push ahead. So I think a lot is about educating uh, our residents, but I have to say they are doing a really good job, the fact that we're number seven, so they're listening. But I guess we need to push that, that home far more. Okay, I can't see anybody online that wants to question, or a question. I can't see any else speaking, wishing to speak. So shall we go for a vote for the amended document? All those in favor? Okay, that's just none against us. Um, that brings us to the end of the agenda. So thank you, colleagues, and forgive us about the adjournment. I'm sure you can understand when you heard the contents that we need just to regroup very quickly and understand where we were. Um, thank you to all the officers involved in all the reports today. It's been a pretty meaty agenda of about 747,000 pages. Fortunately, we, we haven't printed it out to demonstrate our climate emergency credentials. So thank you to all that contributed. Thank you for these today, and have a good evening. Thank you. <laughs>